you're surrounded by all sorts of conversations around the prices are going like this. Change is happening so fast that we can't even get our heads around it. Something about half of our largest companies will be out of business in a number of years, and that we won't know where the disruption is gonna come from. It's gonna come from the side. So you're still feeling great. I think that's a, that's a huge sign of optimism. Um, but I think it raises a really interesting question, and that is how do we chart our way forward? It's one thing to know those things. The question is, how do we hold ourselves in that type of uncertainty or that rate of change? I came across a really interesting quote quite a while ago by Joy Ito, um, who's at the MIT Media Lab. He said this. So he was talking about planning. This is usually how we chart our course. He said, the cost of planning now exceeds the cost of experimentation. You can think in your own life, how do you lead your families, how you lead your teams or your community efforts, your organizations, your cities, your country. What's the ratio of planning to chart your way forward to experimentation? And this raises something really interesting, and that is in a world of constant change, you know that by the time you finish your plan, this was hinted at yesterday, by the time you finish your plan, it's either wrong or it's irrelevant. And in a time of constant change, it means we have to continually adapt and evolve and innovate. Innovation implies that you can't predict the outcome. If you say, oh, that's the outcome we need, that's not innovation. Innovation is unexpected. And I think we know how to lead ourselves towards known outcomes, but how do we lead ourselves towards unknown outcomes. I don't think we know that as much. So we rely on sort of the, the false sense of security of the clarity of a plan as opposed to an attitude of experimentation to evolve our way forward. About 14 years ago, I helped start, um, it was a very unexpected thing for me as an entrepreneur. I never thought I'd work in a university. But I had the opportunity to help start um, and then lead for over a decade an education program at Stanford called the D School. How many of you have been to California? How many of you have been to Stanford campus? It's beautiful, isn't it? When I first approached it as a prospective student, I thought it was like a vacation spot. And then how many of you have been to the D School? Some of you. The next time you're in the area, please come to the D School. Um, the D School, it started in a double wide trailer and evolved to ultimately this uh, 30,000 square foot space at the center of campus. It's a place where all faculty and students from all disciplines can come to tackle problems that require the combination of their points of view and to practice what many people now call design thinking, a set of creative behaviors that allow a collaborative and diverse team to tackle a really hard unknown problem that, where the solution isn't obvious or everything else that we've tried hasn't worked and know that they're gonna get to an innovative outcome. For us, too many students or leaders walk around not feeling creative because they can't, they, they think they're not creative because they can't draw. So somehow we've over-associated creativity with just the arts, and that's a, it's a really important part of creativity. But to us, every act is a creative act. Designing a business model is a creative act. Designing a hospital experience is a creative act. Designing a fourth grade curriculum or a hiring process or how you communicate with your children are all creative acts. And if we don't educate our leaders and our kids to strengthen their creative muscles alongside their analytical skills, they go out unprepared to navigate this future. So um, I will talk a little bit about design thinking in the middle of the talk, but I thought I'd wrap the design thinking story in a larger story that I don't normally talk about. And that is, if your goal, let's assume you're able to unleash the full creative potential of everyone in your organization or in your country. Let's just start with the organization for now. How do you lead them? How do you lead a group of people towards unknown outcomes? How do you organize yourself and hold yourself if you want to release their creativity? And so for me, the D School was a bit of a personal experiment of leadership. And I drew on something that I encountered back in 1995 called emergent behavior. Is, who's here has heard, I didn't hear of it before, who's heard of emergent behavior? A couple. So it's a word that not everyone hears, but it's something we see everywhere. So it's easier to show as opposed to talk about. So emergent behavior, is the type of behavior you'll see in collective systems like schooling of fish or hives of bees. Now, for those of you who have paid attention, I find these things really fascinating. For those of you who have paid attention to these types of systems, they challenge a lot of our notions about leadership. And the D school for me was in a chance to experiment. Can I create and lead in an emergent way? So hives of bees, they don't have a leader, not in the way that we think of it. 
So the queen bee is there, and her job is just to lay the colony's eggs. She's not telling the other bees what to do. Yet they organize themselves in remarkable ways. So colonies of ants, also an emergent system, again, no leader. One of the properties of emergent systems is they operate on really simple rules, like the rules of an ant, really, really simple rules. But when you run that at a system level, the emergent behaviors, which are the behaviors of the collective, are by definition unpredictable from the local rules. So a, a colony of ants, as a collective, can regulate temperature. And then right about the times of the rains, they will create little turrets around their entrances so rain doesn't fall in. How do they know that? No ant knows any, no single ant knows anything about temperature or rains. So those emergence properties are unpredictable from the local rules. That's one of the things that makes them really hard for us to understand. One of my favorite emergence systems are, are flocks of birds. How many of you have seen like the flocks of birds, the sterlings over, well, flocks of birds, you see them just about everywhere, but like the sterlings over the wetlands of, of England? Yeah, spectacular. I'm going to show you a quick video. Here's what, hold on a second. Here's what I'd ask you to do. Pay attention. And then, when the what are the, what right, are the properties that you see, the attributes the of these systems? Should be we pull the volume down just a little? What are some of the attributes you see of these systems? Okay, that was a question. What are some of the attributes you see of these systems? Synchronization, self-organizing, they're fluid, they're highly adaptive, they're flexible, no leader, we, we're not sure how leadership works. The question is, how do they communicate with each other? We'll get to that in a second. They're extremely resilient. These attributes of flexibility and resilience and adaptability and fluidity, we know we need that today. It's not how we organize ourselves traditionally. And this isn't to discount um, the way we organized in the past, like from the industrial era. This is what it took for us to reach scale and predictability, and it's amazing what it has accomplished. We can put things in space, we can talk to people on the other side of the planet, but I think we're already, or for quite some time, we've moved into a new territory and we're finding the limits of this ways of thinking. I remember, I mean, we're starting to see um, examples over and over again where the things we create are, create, are approaching biologic complexity. Not industrial complexity, biologic complexity. So they have these attributes. This is SimCity. Anyone play this game? Will Wright invented it a long time ago. EA bought it and then expanded it. We did a project really early on the D school with EA and Will Wright, and they were, they were talking to us. They said this was a really challenging game for them to design because the way the designers had to design was at the local rule level. Like, how does traffic work? When are players happy? Are they hungry? It's like really local rules. But the gameplay, whether it was fun to play, was at the emergent level. And you couldn't really predict whether it was fun to play until you ran the system. And they were struggling to find programmers who can mine that gap between working at local rules and, and seeing what happens at the emergent level. We're finding many examples of things that we create that biologic complexity, whether it's our communication networks or our pharmaceuticals. Um, here's, a, uh, I think, a design firm in San Francisco visualized how something spreads across Facebook. Can you take a look? What does that look like? It looks organic. This is something we've built, and it looks organic. So when these systems approach, bio, if what we're living in is a world and systems that run on biologic rules, when these systems run on biologic rules, we have to lead with those sorts of rules. If we try to live and lead in systems with biologic rules using industrial rules, we will fail. One of the challenges, we don't educate our kids to think this way. And then we throw them into a world that runs on these systems or these, these rules. Yesterday, I heard a lot of discussion. What it was talked about is that in this world of exponential change, our minds aren't prepared to even understand and think that way. I, I'm not sure that's true. If you look at all of our senses, our hearing, our sight, they run, their sensitivities are logarithmic. They are compounding in nature. Our number sense, research shows our number sense. If you ask a child about their number sense, it's not linear, it's logarithmic. If you look at tribes in the, the Amazon that haven't been affected by Western education, their natural number sense is logarithmic. So if we're struggling to wrap our heads around compounding effects or emergent systems, it's not 
it's probably more of a product of our education than it is our natural latent ability. And so I, I don't see a lot of evidence in our education system that we're preparing kids to think in biologic ways as opposed to linear industrial ways. And I would suggest that needs to change. We can try it on right here. And it's tricky when you want to maybe lead an organization in an emergent way. Um, I found it to be quite different than the way I learned to lead as a CEO. So let's try it on as an example. Let's say we are responsible for leading a school of fish. How would you tell the group of fish where to go and how to find food? What's that? Swim with them? They're not looking for a boss fish to tell them where to go. But, yeah, what? So right out of the gate, you, have to, you realize that we tend to think about the group and telling people where to go and how to work. In emergent systems, we have to think at the local level again and think at the rules of the fish. Okay, so if, if you just say, well, what are the rules? Don't think of the outcomes. Think of the, just the rules of the fish. How would you articulate rules of a fish so that they would school? You're saying we put something that they can sense or smell to attract them. Okay, let's get to that in a second. What's the rule? Of, not what you put in the environment. What, do you put, what are the rules of the fish to school? What's that? Swim. Okay, so keep swimming. Yes, if you see something that looks, if you see food, swim towards it. What's another rule? Stay close to the other fish. Not too close, but not too far. Okay. Okay, if you see something, she's asked about predators. If you see something scary, run away. Some way. Let's, yeah, stay close to the one next to you. Let's say that's it. Hold on, what's that? Follow patterns of currents, maybe temperature. So let's, let's keep it simple to start. Um, swim close to your neighbor, but not too close. If you see some food, swim towards it. If you see something scary, run away. That's it. Now, and you, you won't know what the collective behavior is by thinking it through, it's only when you run this system. This is another challenge of leadership. It's not until you get started, do you know? So let's say we start running this system and all the fish are moving. This one's swimming close to that one and they just move around. It looks like the birds. This one over here, let's see it finds some food. It goes to the food. The one next to it has the rules, stay close to your neighbor. It goes and pretty soon they're, they're amazing at foraging. And you haven't had to articulate anything about foraging for this system. And if they're swimming along and this one sees something scary, it swims away and the one next to it swims away and it'll cascade and they'll do predator avoidance better than just anyone else and you didn't have to articulate a strategy for defense. And if you see collective behaviors that are not expected or not necessarily what you want, you don't try to control the group anymore, you go back to the local rules and you change the local rule and you run the system and it's that back and forth that matters. Okay, so if that's how it works with fish, how might that work in an organization? So for the D school, it's quite fascinating. It's very nuanced. There's lots of little strategies that I had to evolve over time. I'll just give one example. So if you think of how you organize yourself, usually organizations have different groups and departments. And you, you know how we diagram those on the org charts that look like that building, hierarchical. But for the D school, to simplify it, we have multiple groups. We have a group of staff that runs the D school. We have faculty or teachers. And then we have students. Now as a leader, as a CEO, when I was an entrepreneur, I would think of all my different groups. And I could be a human-centered leader, and I would look at the, the staff and try to understand what their work is like and what their needs are like and design for them and equip them and support that work. And then I would move over to the teachers and I understand the faculty needs and how they work and what expertise they need and support their work in the best way possible, then I'd move over to the students and I'd understand who they are and their culture and their needs and design for them. And each group would probably be running quite well, but I, without knowing it, I've set up a system with multiple dynamics that could cause internal politics or friction because they're all tuned differently. So instead of thinking of them like groups that we manage in a machine that we're creating, think of them like a collective system. So the first thing we have to do is imagine them as one group. And the next thing is start breaking them up into smaller elements. And this is where it gets tricky. How do you know what the unit of a fish is in this example? So what I found is you just take the system and you just start breaking it up in your mind until you see a pattern that you see everywhere. So I kept doing that. Is it the class? No, like 40 students, no. Um, the pattern I found everywhere was the four-person collaborative team. So the design thinking, the way we teach, everything's done in a collaborative way with diverse expertise. So the students were practicing design thinking in four-person collaborative teams. The faculty were teaching in four-person collaborative teams. And our staff would be running the operations in four-person collaborative teams. 
So once I found that pattern that existed everywhere, that's like the fish. And then you start asking, well, what are the rules of behavior? Not rules like bounded, but like what are the behaviors you want to amplify like the fish? For us, design thinking were the behaviors we wanted the entire culture to be running on. For those of you who have encountered design thinking, there's lots of different ways to diagram it. It's not really a process, like a business process. It's a scaffolding for new behaviors. If you come to the workshop, you'll get a chance to practice what it feels like to use these behaviors. But instead of teaching our kids to think through a problem and come up with the right answer, we ask them to start with empathy and understand the human experience and prototype their way forward. I'll tell a really quick story just to get a feel for what it's like to use these behaviors. Um, we work with executives and students and kids. This is just a real quick executive story. So you can see how the behaviors work. So Doug Dietz is a leader at GE. GE, one of the largest companies in the world. And this is his, so he's in GE Medical. And there are other units like transportation and energy. So in GE Medical, this is a baby. So he thought of himself already as very creative. He's a designer by profession and uh, very successful. His job was to design the best possible MRI machine. And he looks at it and he says, this is the type of thing that you could, it's so beautiful, you could take a picture, put it on a postcard, put GE's logo on it, and feel really good about your brand. So he felt creative and very successful. He came to the D School Exec Ed workshop. He learned about design thinking behaviors of empathy and prototyping, and the power of empathy of understanding the human experience. Instead of thinking away through the problem, understand the human experience. He said, oh, interesting. I've been to a hospital before for installations, but never to witness and have empathy for the, the human experience. So after the workshop, he goes home and he visits a local hospital. And he's standing, he gets a tour, he gets brought into the radiology room, they open the door and he sees his big uh, machine. It's probably well lit and probably hears music in the back of his head, so he's feeling really good. At that time, it just so happened that a seven-year-old girl was getting a scan. So he describes, it changed his life. He describes his story. He's looking at the machine this way, and the little girl with her parents come walking down the hall this way. And the, the, the girl has no idea what's going on, so she's just sort of skipping down the hall. But the parents, he could tell, are, are very stressed. So he doesn't know why the girl is there or what the procedure is. But the parents are worried, how did I get my child through this procedure? So he's standing there as they turn the corner. What do you think happens? The girl is terrified. Right? If you imagine, look at the machine down here, it's this monster of a thing. So she starts screaming and clinging to her parents' legs. And the stress rises, the parents get more worried, the technicians are stressed, the procedure takes a lot of time. Um, and this girl, like 80%, Doug learns, 80% of all children who get an MRI scan, scan had to be sedated to stay still. So at that moment, he went from feeling very successful to a complete failure. He had never once thought that he had a design experience for the child. So then he used the rest of the design thinking behaviors. I need to have empathy for these kids, what their life is like. So he brought a child, a museum, museum child direct, a child's museum director and patient advocacy groups to help him understand what are the life of these kids. So he got kids in for the summer and they got down on gym maps and he's asking them, tell me about your life. And he learned things like going to camp. And he said, oh, my job, maybe, this is where the insight is. My job is not to design a scanner. My job is to design an adventure for these children. As soon as you say, how do I design an adventure for children, lots of different ideas come up. And an idea in GE takes a very long time to fund. So he didn't wait for that. He got a, he got a hospital director with the story of this girl. She was willing to try a very simple experiment. So with nothing more uh, expensive than the type of decals that go on buses, he was able to create something he calls the adventure series. So the decals are on the big machine that looks like a tent. And the, kid, the child ahead of time, they get a backpack sent to their home. Inside the backpack is a cartoon comic book that talks about going to camp. When the child is brought to the hospital, instead of checking in with a the nurse, they check in with a camp counselor, which is just a nurse in a vest as opposed to a nurse in a white outfit. The camp counselor walks the child into this room and says, we're all going to camp. Your job is to stay in the tent. And if you stay really still, you can hear the sounds at night. So they ran this experiment, and then they ran it in 12 different hospitals with different designs. In a very quick amount of time, a matter of months, they reduced the sedation rate from 80% to almost zero, which reduced the time of the procedures, reduced the risk because the child's not under anesthesia. The throughput for the hospitals went up. Patient satisfaction went up 99%. It pulled something like $30 million of new business into GE. So that's just one small example. If you use these small behaviors, like the school of the fish, of empathy, 
and rapid prototyping and collaboration in an iterative way, you get to unexpected outcomes. Now those, if we come back to the emergent leadership, that's all, instead of fixing direction and saying, you go that way and you go that way, and this is the way our company goes, and aligning incentives towards those goals, which we will hit those goals but crush creativity, you release your sense of what direction you're going, you, are, you, are, you find the pattern that works across the whole organization, and you articulate and nurture those behaviors. For us, it was the design thinking behaviors of empathy and prototyping. And so our executives were using that, our faculty are using these behaviors to design their classes, our staff were using these behaviors to redesign the reimbursement, the receipt reimbursement process. And once all the little units in the organization, the ecosystem, start humming in the same simple rules, instead of having multiple groups that have tension and dynamics between them, you get a collective that started having cascading and compounding effects, naturally compounding effects, which is what exponential thinking is all about. And when you have that emergent system running, then you get the unpredictable emergent behaviors. One of the things that was really surprising for me is as the multiple companies I started before the D school, you know, it was unpredictable whether you would hit an innovation or the value you'd create. I think the whole venture business is based on the idea that only one in 10 succeed. When we were running this way, something like seven out of 10 student projects would continue after class. The hit rate was much higher. And then the value created was orders of magnitude more than anything that I ever expected. So we had, like Doug's project, we had innovations and improvement in medical imaging, and we had no agenda in improving medical imaging. We had one student team, many of you have heard probably about Embrace, that are solving for low-cost incubators to reduce infant mortality. We had no agenda in reducing infant mortality around the world. We had another student team provide alternative lighting, low-cost LED lighting to over 65 million people in a matter of years. We had no agenda in alternative lighting. These are the amazing um, effects of unexpected um, outcomes of emergent systems. The thing I think to remember is there is no leader, at least in the way we have come to understand it. I think there is a very important job for a leader, but the leader is not to tell everyone which way to go or how to work or what to do. It's to hold the space in which everyone can lead in concert with each other. Because you don't know where the best ideas are going to come from or where the insights are gonna come from. And you want the whole collective to be able to find what's interesting, find the greatest value, and then solve for that. I remember that this was the natural way that I was leading, but I didn't tell my team. <laughs> and about halfway through the D school, the sort of the two and back, Scott Dorley, who's like now the creative day director in Charlotte, um, who's our community director. Scott has then written the book, Make Space. Some of you have heard that. He designed all of our spaces. They were, about, they were, they were so frustrated and one of them was about ready to quit, and they, I was on my way out the door to go home, and they stopped me, and they pulled me into one of our brainstorming rooms, and they started yelling at me. And they're like, you can't lead this way. Like they were, what's interesting, what I realized there was you can't just lead people, try, try emergent leadership without talking about it, because everyone in our organization, as creative as they were, they were expecting, they were looking to me like the CEO for direction. If I wasn't stepping out that way, it was very confusing. So in that meeting, we had a conversation, they're like, oh, oh, wait, we get to pick the direction? Um, and then all of a sudden it flipped for them. So then, instead of me articulating direction, my job was to be, help everyone understand the context. And then everyone, based on the context, would identify what felt more, most important to them and then form groups and then go, go from there. Um, it started to get really interesting after a while. If you can build that trust and that type of agency in all your teams, the group will self-organize and self-lead itself. I remember times when I would just be holding the group together, and then they would identify a big challenge that we were facing, self-commission a team, and then go execute against it. And I didn't have to identify it, commission a team, or follow through on their execution. Now these systems are really delicate, they can collapse like that. I wouldn't take an industrial model if you have a big organization and just try to push that on all at once. I would start, these systems have to be grown over time, but they will have all the capabilities that I think you saw the flocking birds. A couple of final thoughts, I think. One of the things that I found in leading in an emergent leadership sort of way, which is a way to hold a creative ecosystem that can unleash the creativity of everyone in your organization, it was about the instincts were about 180 degrees off or different from all the instincts I had learned as a CEO. I remember when I was in my second startup as a CEO doing one of those venture-backed software companies, and the mentor of mine told me, okay, your job as a CEO is to imagine your organization that's growing very rapidly like this tumbleweed going down a hill. It's growing, getting bigger. And if it gets caught on something, 
Like something's not working, either in the organization or outside, your job is to identify what's not working and go fix it so that the thing can keep tumbling down the hill and growing. So that's, when I moved into venture capital, I was doing that, I was helping the companies that were struggling, and a partner of mine came up and said, stop doing that. I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, doesn't matter if that company's not working, no amount in the portfolio, no amount of effort will really make the difference. Focus on the companies that are working and you'll increase the return. So I took, that's a property of emergent systems, is instead of focusing on what's not working, you amplify what is working. So you can think of, if you have your ecosystem running, and I had faculty who, who would ask me, aren't you gonna do something about that class over there? It's not working well. And I said, no, I'm actually helping amplify this one. So you can think of it like a wildfire and find the little spots where it's burning bright and pour more gas on it. And the parts that aren't working, they'll look to that and it'll be an example and they'll adapt on their own or they'll fall away. It's a really unexpected way of working. The other interesting thing I would highlight, and there are many other examples about leading this way that were 180 degrees off, but one thing, another property of these systems is their relationship to scale. We're talking about how do we scale at exponential rates. I think our natural wiring for senses are logarithmic. How do we scale organizationally? These systems, the biological systems, are fractal in nature. Has anyone seen the Mandelbrot set? It's a mathematical equation that talks about fractals. So fractals means a system where the same pattern exists at all scales. So if you look, there's this round thing with a little small ball in it. If you zoom in, you'll see another round thing with a small ball. If you zoom in, you'll see another small round ball with a... So the same pattern exists at all scales. You will see this everywhere in nature. I asked my 12-year-old son, hey, I'm talking... He's asking, what am I talking about? I said, fractals. He goes, oh, you mean like the Nautilus shell? I'm like, yes. So the same pattern, it just exists at all scales. Trees, what are trees? Other than like a branch that branches, and that branch branches, and that branch branches, and that branch branches. If you go into the smaller scale, you look at a leaf, what is a leaf? It's fascinating, just more branches. I think one of the largest organisms in the world is an aspen forest, aspen trees. It's not many trees, it's one tree with a single root system. Right? So the relationship to scale, this is what it feels like if you solve at the local level and then run this system, here's what scale looks like. This is a bunch of dancers for a video I think that was made in Singapore recently. Try to figure out how they do this. How do you think they did that? A kaleidoscope. You guys know those little toys, right, with little mirrors? So all they did is they focused on the, like, the, just a small group of dancers, the unit, and got a little choreography. There's a video that shows how this video is made. So imagine a kaleidoscope, with three mirrors, like the size of three stories above the dancers, and they have a camera, and they pull the camera up through the mirrors while the dancers are dancing. So this is just what it feels like for a system that runs on small rules that replicates. It feels very different than the way our work feels. Usually that our work takes life out of us. This, this type of system brings life into us. So if, we, if you focus on the right pattern and you get that right, you, you simultaneously solve it at the local level and the global level at the same time. Because of that fractal nature, it exists at all scales. So these systems approach scale in ways that our past strategies have not. And I think we need to approach things that are scale independent if we're going to approach something of this scale. This is now the scale we have to be working on. Okay, and the approach things of this scale in the past, our industrial models and structures took creativity out of the system. These days, the structures and models we have to build ourselves around have to include creativity in it so we can keep evolving, adapting, and be resilient. And one final thought is if you think about the future, this, these are my three boys. The future is already here. Their natural wiring. All kids start creative. All kids start school with their creativity intact, and somehow we educate them out of it. So that needs to change. I think that's one of the most tragic things: is we 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 dampen the natural creativity, maybe the most renewable resource we have in our kids. The second one is to equip them to think in these compounding ways. 
and then put them into systems that are adapted and re resilient as opposed to not. And my hunch is we will we'll find our way in a flourishing way forward. Thank you, thank you very much.